The east coast of the United States of America stretches almost 2,500 kilometers from Florida, through the southern states, past New York and Boston, to the Canadian border. Nowhere is the American way of life as much fun as on the splendid beaches of Florida. But it's not only about enjoying the present. The Sunshine State also retains vestiges of an eventful history. The Florida Keys. More than 800 islands strung out like a chain of pearls. The journey continues through the Everglades and Miami to America's rocket launch complex and the lesser known north towards the border with Georgia. The Florida Keys. At their southernmost tip, a more laid back side of the USA. The lifestyle on these islands is thoroughly relaxed. Many residents came during the 70s to get away from it all and simply never returned to the mainland. The Keys lay on the route of the Spanish treasure fleets that transported the riches of the colonies to Europe during the 17th century. The area is regularly frequented by hurricanes. Approximately 400 cargo ships are believed to have sunk nearby. To this day, divers continue to search for sunken treasures off Key West. You just found it, yep. right here. All right. And uh, this has all never been dug. This is right all here. underwater finds are carefully marked on a grid. It's like searching for a needle in a haystack. But Kim Fisher and his crew are sure there has to be gold here. Was this uh, an experiment? If you're going to be a treasure hunter, you have to have lots of persistence and patience. It's not easy, and, and it takes a lot of money and time and, uh, and perseverance. You're going to dig a lot of empty holes before you find one full of treasure. For more than 15 years, Kim's father, Mel Fisher, searched for the wreck of the Atocha, a legendary Spanish galleon. Everyone thought he was crazy until he actually struck it rich. Everybody dreams about looking for buried treasure, and I got to live that dream. I was going out on a boat when I was six years old, and when I was nine, I convinced my father to let me start diving for treasure. And I found my first piece of eight when I was nine years old, and I've been hooked ever since. The Atocha's gold. Kim Fisher's goal is to bring up the entire treasure, which has been lying on the seabed for almost 400 years. Gold, silver, and emeralds. The treasure of the Atocha is said to be worth more than $450 million. But to whom does it belong? The fishers were the ones who discovered it, and they had invested a lot in terms of equipment, manpower, and years of expeditions. But there was a problem. The state of Florida and the federal government both uh, claimed ownership. And my dad tried to make a deal with them. He offered them 35%. And they said they wanted it all. So we went to court for eight years. And it went to the United States Supreme Court. And they said, finders keepers. So we got it all. The hunt for treasure is not only about silver and gold. Other valuable historical artifacts are salvaged as well. Oh, that's neat. Oh, thank you. 
Nails and cannonballs from the Atocha, solid proof that the ship really existed. At initial glance, it just looks like a rock. You know, it doesn't look like treasure, except the gold. The gold is shiny, so when you see gold, you know it's treasure. Every time I find something, it's an incredible thrill. It's a very addictive feeling. Even if it's not gold or silver, it's just, it's just a, a neat feeling. You wonder, you know, who is the last person to hold that piece or use it? You know, the history behind it. It's, it's a, it's a never-ending history lesson. So every time we find something, we learn something new. Just as shiny as the day it sank. Oh, it's heavy. Oh, <laughs> when we're all dead, this gold will be just as shiny. And it just uh, passes from hand to hand and from man to man forever. The name Key comes from the Spanish Cayo, meaning small island. The keys comprise exposed sections of an ancient coral reef. Fidel Castro's Cuba lies just 180 kilometers to the south as the crow flies. A radar aerostat known as Fat Albert is constantly on the lookout for suspicious activities. The remnants of an old railway track, partially swept away in 1935 by hurricanes, still lie in the sea to this day. Nowadays, only the overseas highway connects the islands to the mainland. The Seven Mile Bridge is the most spectacular of its 42 spans over water. On Marathon, there's a specialty clinic where sea turtles are cared for. One patient is being transported to the operating room right now. This is Captain Hook and he was found in the Florida Bay. Uh, they, when they looked inside of his mouth they saw part of this fish hook as you can see in the radiograph. So he was brought into the turtle hospital so that we could remove the hook. It was very large. Sea turtles snap at almost anything they find in the water, and it was Captain Hook's appetite that did him in. An adult sea turtle has um, very few natural predators. Unfortunately, in order to understand why sea turtles are endangered, we need to look at the actions of humans. Uh, marine debris is a big one, the ingestion of, of trash and plastic, also entanglement from fishing line and fishing gear, the commercial fishing industry. Marine biologist Betty Zirkelbach wants to make sure that the sea turtles will still be here for her grandchildren to see. What I love about sea turtles is they're like working with dinosaurs. Um, they're ancient and you just get that feeling when you work with them. They've been on the planet and survived many things in 200 million years. Um, we're here to help make sure they survive us as humans. The 
This is the Turtle Hospital's rehabilitation facility. Sea turtles in distress mostly arrive here thanks to reports from the Coast Guard or concerned local residents. Betty and her colleagues are especially worried about a mysterious viral infection that's affecting more and more turtles in Florida. Jack is one such case. When he was brought to the hospital, his shell was covered with algae and his body was full of tumors. Jack gets a bath regularly. He gets the algae scrubbed off of him. He's currently on a broad spectrum antibiotic and that's just to keep infection down because he's in the process of getting those soft uh, tumors removed from his soft tissue. So that broad spectrum antibiotic will keep him healthy through that. Also fluids, whenever we give medications to the turtles, we make sure we give them fluids and keeps their kidneys healthy. Jack bravely makes it through his daily IV drip session. The Turtle Hospital is the only certified veterinarian hospital for strictly for sea turtles in the world. We see patients from different countries are flown to us and we receive an average of 50 to 70 patients per year. Captain Hook is all better and ready to return home to the open waters of the sea. I'm a water baby, always have been, so if I'm not fixing a sea turtle, which I, I do do most days, um, you'll find me under the water scuba diving. Um, we have amazing marine life here and around the Florida Keys, and I have to say it is paradise. My favorite part of my job is taking those turtles back to their ocean home and seeing them um, swim off. Even if they're here over a year, once we place them back in the ocean, they just swim off and they don't even turn around or send Christmas cards. They're gone. The overseas highway continues northward through this tropical paradise. Passing island after island on its way to the mainland. Key Largo is the northernmost of the Florida Keys. The archipelago of the Keys is surrounded by the third largest coral barrier reef in the world, the only coral barrier in the United States. Reefs around the world are threatened by global warming and other impacts. These divers are floating through an amazing kind of garden. This is a nursery that's home to more than 35,000 coral fragments.
We grow most of our corals on a tree nursery, which is like a little Christmas tree. It's a big PVC pipe and it has arms branching out of it that we can hang um, staghorn and elkhorn corals from. And when we hang them on there, we put a little loop around the coral and a piece that's the size of your pinky can grow to be about the size of two palms of your hands in just a year. Kayla Ripple is a marine biologist with a dream to rescue the coral reef at Key Largo. Kayla and her colleagues at the Coral Restoration Foundation are setting out for a morning trip to the nursery. Her dedication to salvaging the reef was motivated by a defining experience. It all started back when I was in college and I did a study abroad course to Roatan, Honduras and I remember seeing this field of staghorn coral and it was so beautiful and it's something I'll always remember. And then I would come snorkeling and diving here at the reefs in Key Largo and it used to look like it did in Roatan and other countries where they had these pristine reefs and now it's just degraded and there's almost 98% of our coral is lost. Ocean warming due to climate change contributes to the corals dying off. So what we're gonna do is Jessica and Pam are gonna go down and they're gonna cut corals and prepare them for us. And we're gonna go on a little tour. Patty's gonna bring up the rear so if anyone seems to stray away from the It's group, a race against time, which Kayla and the team from the Coral Restoration Foundation are determined to win. Just as a destroyed forest might be replanted, it's their plan to replant the coral reef. The corals grown in nurseries are especially resistant to rising water temperatures. The divers attach them to the reef using a special adhesive. actually plant them in a one meter circle so that they create a natural staghorn thicket already. So that when these corals grow, those branches are gonna fuse together and create a nice 3D structure and 3D habitat for all of these different reef fishes to start inhabiting. The fish are so curious. They love the corals as soon as we put them down there. It's pretty amazing to see the life they attract just the minute you put them there. Key Largo is a hot spot for diving and it's just a part of my life that I've never wanted to give up and I'm so happy to be here and be with the ecosystems that I love most. From Key Largo on to the Everglades Swamp, then through exciting Miami, towards Boca Raton. Mangrove forests and uninhabited islands, this is Florida's wild side. Everglades. This swampland is home to myriads of species and has been declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO.
few people venture out into this wilderness. Jesse Kennan learned how to deal with the inherent dangers of the Everglades when he was a young boy. In his airboat, he navigates through every corner of the marsh. It is actually like a large grass prairie. It's made out of sawgrass, thrush, and needle grass. The water flows at roughly about one mile per day, so it's actually called a river of grass. Some call Jesse Kennan the king of the Everglades. But the real rulers of the swamp are lurking down below. The alligator is a dominant part in, and the monarch of the Everglades, so you're going to see more alligators than you will see most anything else in the glades. So in the state of Florida, you have about a million and a half alligators. Jesse knows where the alligators are hiding. He's spent so many years observing them, he can now even speak their language. That sound is the sound of a baby alligator, like a little small alligator, and it creates curiosity for the adults. They always check it out and see what it is, not just something like this. Alligators are not as aggressive as crocodiles. Still, it pays to be careful. Uh, if you would put your hands out, it would be dangerous. You don't want to put your hands out because they do have the capabilities. If they got your hand, they could take your hand off. So you definitely don't want to do that. You don't want to try and touch them. Just look at them, stay a safe distance, and you're fine. Jesse's family came to the Everglades back in the 40s in search of work. They ended up hunting frogs, selling frog's legs as a local delicacy. As a child, Jesse Kennan learned that one needs to be able to adapt in order to survive in the Everglades. The Kennans founded their own town, Coopertown. Current population, exactly eight, all members of the Kennan family. Well, I'm the mayor of Coopertown because somebody has to take care of the responsibilities. That's me. I get elected for that, okay? We have a restaurant. We have our big house, the main house. We have a repair maintenance shop, okay? We have a bait and tackle shop. Okay, you're welcome. Looks good. Yep. Good, how are you? Good. Fish all ready? The fish are ready for you. Okay, that looks good. Yep. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck over there. All right. Fishing is a popular pastime in Florida, and it's often more about relaxation than actually catching fish. I like Florida itself because it has a lot to offer to you. Like we have the ecosystem of the Everglades, which is very unique. It's the only place in the world that exists like exactly like this. It's very magical and mystical to me because I like it out there. It's very tranquil. It uh, has a lot of different wildlife. It's very soothing. If you've had a hard day and it's like one of those days it just never ends, you can get on the boat, just go out there and relax. Within an hour by car from this wilderness, Miami, the so-called magic city, home to the world's largest cruise ship port. Luxury liners fan out across the Caribbean from here. Hard to believe that at the end of the 19th century, Miami was just a tiny village with a population of 300. The city's growth began when the first rail line reached here. 
The venerable Biltmore Hotel lies just outside Miami, in the upmarket suburb of Coral Gables. The town is home to the rich and famous, and supposedly the drug lords too. Key Biscayne, with its warm waters, is a local party hotspot. <laughs> Nearly a century ago, it was the stilt houses of Stiltsville on the edge of Biscayne Bay that served as a popular gathering place for Miami's merrymakers. The Prohibition-era ban on alcohol simply was not taken very seriously in these wooden shacks. Miami Beach is the East Coast's most legendary stretch of sand. The infamous Ocean Drive and its promenade. In 1997, Fashion designer Gianni Versace was shot dead outside his villa. He was on his way to get the morning paper. This series of beaches stretch north from Miami towards Boca Raton. Delray Beach, when the wind is blowing, is a top spot for kite surfers. Sean Raingood is one of them. Surfing means everything to him, but the very fact that he can even walk the beach today is amazing in itself. An accident many years ago nearly cost him his life. When I was 19 years old, I was working at a fish house on Summerlin Key, and uh, I was injured in a forklift accident, and the forklift drugged me for about 10 feet, and my foot was completely mangled, and at that point, I thought life was over. I didn't know what, if I would ever be able to run again in my life or be able to do anything. You know, I was an athlete before, running track in high school, cross country, played baseball, soccer. And I was a pretty fit athlete. I was depressed for a long time and uh, just really didn't know what to do until I was able to uh, get my prosthesis. That changed my whole life for me. I started training again about a year after I lost my leg because I heard about this contest called the Extremity Games. It's only for amputees. They have wakeboarding, rock climbing, skateboarding and BMX, and I really wanted to try out for it because it was the first year they were holding it, so I got back on the board and, you know, tried to get my leg back in the situation that it needed to be to stay on in the water. Sean trains daily on a water ski cableway. The challenges have only made him stronger. Went out for the contest and did really well. I got first place and it kind of helped my drive forward and pushing myself to the limit. Sean won the wakeboard competition at the Extremity Games six times in a row.
Carving wooden figures in his backyard helps him clear his mind. With his prosthesis, Sean can keep on living the life he wants to live. The lifestyle here in South Florida is kind of a beach lifestyle. This is pretty laid back. It's like island style. So everybody's got to be somewhat presentable in their swimwear. And uh, I think that, you know, everybody wants to be fit and active. And it's a good lifestyle. You got to move forward with whatever happened and just be appreciative of what you have and uh, just make the best out of your life because you only got one time here and you got to enjoy it the most you can. The journey continues up the coast from Boca Raton through Vero Beach towards the rocket launch site at Cape Canaveral. Life revolves around the beach all along Florida's sunny Atlantic coast. The Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts, America's financial elite, used to stay here at Palm Beach's luxury hotel, The Breakers. Florida boasts more days of sunshine per year than any other part of the USA, the perfect climate for growing citrus fruit. Cheryl Roseland of Vero Beach comes from a long line of citrus farmers. My father planted his first grove in the early 1960s on 10 acres. We, of course, would go out and, and pick the oranges when I was little and walk around peeling the oranges, eating the oranges, of course, dripping down our faces and leaving the peels all over the yard so he always could tell where we'd been. Florida is the world's second biggest producer of oranges, second only to Brazil. The harvest lasts from October through spring. fruit comes in from the groves, it goes through um, a process where as the leaves, the twigs, that kind of thing gets rolled off of them, they go through a washing process and then a very thin uh, layer of food grade wax is put on the fruit in order to protect um, it, it, seals the, it seals the fruit so that no um, bacteria and that sort of thing um, can penetrate the skin. It's a safety measure. Together with her uncle, Cheryl is packing boxes of the choicest fruits. Sending food as gifts in the United States has become very popular, whether it's citrus or apples or pears. And so we have a very robust business of gift fruit shipping, primarily around Christmas time, um, which is good for us because that's when the fruit is good and that's when people like to send gifts. As more and more retirees move to Florida, 
more and more citrus orchards are disappearing to make way for new homes. Many of the family-owned groves have gone out of business. A lot of them have sold it to real estate developers. There was a real estate boom here several years ago, and they started wanting to grow houses instead of citrus. And um, we're one of the very few families left who actually grows their own citrus. For Cheryl Roseland, the smell of oranges is inextricably linked with memories of her childhood. She intends to carry on her family's tradition, even in the face of adversity. Pelican Island, the oldest designated nature reserve in the United States. This sign warns motorboaters about manatees, but not because these sea cows are dangerous, rather because they're strictly protected under Florida law. They can sometimes be spotted here in the shallow waters. Right in the midst of this idyllic natural landscape sits Cape Canaveral, the USA's rocket launch site. The last space shuttle landed here in 2011. The old spacecraft can still be viewed here today. Daytona is famous for motorsports. From here, we follow the coast up to St. Augustine and onwards to the Georgia border. Florida's northern Atlantic coast is remote and peaceful. The lighthouse at Ponce de Leon Inlet guides ships over a range of 32 kilometers. Its beacon first started operating back in 1887. Daytona Beach, one of the most popular spring break destinations in the US. Thousands of college students throng the area for two weeks of wild partying. The city also holds an irresistible pull for motorsports enthusiasts. Gary Rosier is truly passionate about muscle cars. His 1994 Mustang GT has almost 400 rear-wheel horsepower beneath its sparkling hood. I call it the beast because after we rebuilt it, it's got quite a bit of horsepower and it takes a lot of money to keep going and I, you know, some, it's a love-hate relationship. I'm mad at it sometimes. It's a beast, I say, you know, and then other times it's a beast because it's fun and it's loud and it's nasty. Gary's friends share his passion. When they drop by for a visit, his driveway resembles an automobile museum. Oh. 
they're a bunch of regular guys that uh, we all hang out together. We go to the different shows week in and week out. They live close by and uh, they've got many cars themselves, not just one car. And we just hang out. They're just a good bunch of guys. The old timers with their classic cars wax nostalgic about times when gas was cheap and America was the world's proudest auto manufacturing nation. This 1963 Ford is overheating, but Gary can solve almost any car problem. So how, are gonna, how are we going to solve this uh, starter problem over here? Well, the thing overheats, uh, it gives you all kinds of extra room. Yeah. You go with an LS motor, all of them a lot lighter. Oh, My dad was a mechanic and he always took care of the family car. Back in the day when you could take care of a car, and he taught me everything, you know, how to grease the wheel bearings, how to do uh, brakes and all that. These vintage automobiles are perfect for just cruising around the neighborhood. Today, Gary feels like driving down to the ocean. Americans take their cars everywhere. In Daytona, they can even drive right onto the beach. The 38-kilometer long stretch of hard-packed sand was home to auto racing events up until the early 60s. The reason I came to Daytona Beach, Florida was because I've always been a gearhead, always been about cars, and I noticed down here that there was a lot of car shows, things to do car related, automotive related, you know. That's what it's all about, you know. It's famous for its beach, and it is a gorgeous beach. Gary Rosier and his Mustang, a match made in hot rod heaven. Just listen to the sound of the engine, you know, it's like music to your ears, you know. Being one with the car and the gears and every once in a while you get on it and you go flying by somebody, it's exhilarating. I probably would separate from the beast you never know until the day you go out and sit in it and start it up and just hear it shake and shudder and sputter and, you know, lay rubber for 12 feet or whatever, you know, then it gets back in your blood again and you think differently about it. So, yes, probably, would I? Who knows? Stay tuned. <laughs> From Daytona, it's just 85 kilometers north to St. Augustine. St. Augustine, the oldest continuously occupied European settlement in the USA. In the spring of 1513, Ponce de Leon formally laid claim to the area for the Spanish crown. He named the region La Florida, after the Pascua Florida, the Spanish term for the flowery Easter season, during which they landed. But it was half a century later that the Spanish finally built a permanent settlement along the Florida coast. Castillo de San Marcos Fort was to protect St. Augustine against invasions. 500 years of history. By new world standards, that's quite a lot. City archaeologist Carl Halbert researches St. Augustine's historical heritage.
St. Augustine really is America's first melting pot. Because when Menendez came here, he brought with him not only Spaniards, but he brought people of African descent. They were slaves, all right? Uh, shortly after the founding of St. Augustine, uh, Native Americans started to become assimilated into Spanish society. And so by the 18th century, St. Augustine really is a cosmopolitan community. For more than 20 years, Carl has been studying the area's colorful past. To this day, the city's European influence is unmistakable. The main building of Flagler College was built in the late 1800s as a luxury hotel. At the time of its opening, the Ponce was the most exclusive hotel in the world. Legally, any planned construction project in St. Augustine needs to be reviewed for its potential to impact any buried archaeological resources. I like to think of St. Augustine as kind of like an archaeological gold mine because you cannot stick a shovel into the ground and not hit something. It's just the archaeological heritage is that diverse, that rich, and that unique. Carl and his team meticulously sift through each and every bucket of dirt. Sometimes they unearth nothing more than fragments of seashells. Carl is constantly on the lookout for anything that can give an insight into the lives of early settlers. Carl evaluates his artifacts in his laboratory. Archaeology is the study of trash because we don't have spectacular finds here. You know, what we have are the items that people have left behind. This is the trash that they threw out their window or buried in a pit. Carl Halbert, St. Augustine's own Indiana Jones. The archaeologist is still thrilled by the discovery of what seems to be a normal pottery shard. Wow. Thanks to his experience and expertise, though, he recognizes the piece's true meaning and value. All that we found here is this particular type of pottery, St. John's, and two pieces of Spanish olive jar. And so we're very excited about this because this may this particular site that we're working on right here may be associated with the Menendez encampment. In relation to the St. John's check stamp, that tells us that the Native Americans are interacting with the Spanish. It may have been here on St. Augustine's beach where Europeans first set foot on what's now U.S. territory. I would live no place else. I mean, St. Augustine to an archaeologist, you know, St. Augustine really is nirvana. It's just a short distance to Amelia Island at the Georgia border. And that's where the journey up the Sunshine State's Atlantic coastline ends. 
Florida amazes with secluded beaches, unspoiled nature, and the legacy of the early European settlers.